The Crocus Dukedom of Rebellia has two daughters. One chooses a sword of her dress and is praised as a saint. The other is a noble lady like queen of high society and a supposed villainess. When Archduke Winter Knight of the Amalilith Empire asks one of Crocus' daughter's hands in marriage, Liliel being the only single one is the obvious choice. But being sold to the monster of the knot just because she's an aristocrat they didn't sit well with her, he threatened to end her life she was forced to go through the marriage. In the end, Elizabeth goes in her place to wed the monster Duke of the North. This is the tale of two wounded people discovering what it means to love and be loved. Elizabeth's fiancé heads over to the Crocus residence to call off their wedding. He claimed to have wanted to marry a warm-hearted woman he could truly love, and though he had hoped it would be her, it wasn't. Not sure if he was expecting her to cry, but baby girl nonchalantly tells him his wish will be fulfilled and they could call off the engagement. She had already sent a letter to his residence. She knew he was only doing this so Lilia wouldn't have to go to the north. He tried to argue that this was a decision that had nothing to do with Lilia, but Elizabeth sent him on his way without caring for his explanation. You go, girl. He stormed off as if he wasn't one that came to for trouble first. His sudden absence brought her nothing but relief. At least that was over. The cries of someone with so many responsibilities. But that didn't last long. Because in came her little sister, Liliel, rushing in to confirm if it was indeed true that she had called off the engagement to her fiancé, Lord Camellia. Where did you eat it from? That's the question. She had come to bother Elizabeth despite having etiquette classes she obviously needs. But Liliel didn't care about that. She wanted a response from her sister, Elizabeth, more calmly than I would have. Because why are you shouting at me in my own room? Told her she would be taking her place as the bride of the Duke of Amalilith. Lilia couldn't believe her sister was letting herself be sold off to someone she didn't even know. Oh, good. But Elizabeth had made peace with it. It was, after all, her duty as the daughter of an aristocrat. Something Lilia would have to get used to. But Lilia still didn't understand how selling herself into a marriage was the duty of an aristocrat. Elizabeth recalled how Lilia had thrown a severe tantrum, even when their father had explained it wasn't just a marriage but an alliance between the two kingdoms. She was adamant about not wanting to marry someone referred to as a monster. She was convinced her married life would be miserable, going as far as to threaten to forever silence herself if they said more on the matter. Since she had been so adamant about it, the only other obvious option was for Elizabeth to go. Did she not know that? Elizabeth, as the adult she is, had to head to the palace to settle some work and so had to excuse herself from the conversation. She was clearly uncomfortable. When Liliel asked why she wasn't going with the servants, she pointed out that she would be fine on her own. After all, the servants needed to rest too. Liliel was about pushing the matter, but a tone I can only assume came with authority and had her shutting up. Right at that moment, a group of youngins came to talk to Liliel, visibly unsettled by the presence of the villainess in the back. With the arrival of a carriage, Elizabeth is about to be on her way, but not before bidding farewell to her little sister and not before hearing the less than noble gossip of the youngins. Unable to keep their mouth shut, they called her routine visits to the palace and means to rendezvous with her secret lover, and spent time ogling shiny objects only to go purchase similar items after. Sorry, don't be angry. Liliel tried to call them to order, but the authority in her voice demanding they stop talking shit about her sister must not have been strong enough, because that certainly didn't stop them. These foolish youngins went so far as to say nobody in their right minds would want to marry someone like her who spends her time at parties while wearing luxurious clothes and jewels. Sir, but what do you want her to do for fun? <laughs> it's obvious she agrees with their point of view because she was pretty tight lit through those insults being thrown at her sister. She looked to her sister, who most likely heard all that was said, nonchalantly get on her carriage heading to the palace to be a productive human being. In Amalilith, Duke Winternight receives a report on Elizabeth, the woman he is to marry. Elizabeth, the villainess of rebellion. The Duke wasn't interested in the details. It was a political marriage. His partner didn't matter, much like how Elizabeth feels. All that mattered was he had to fulfill his duty by forming the alliance. After dismissing his butler, he spent some time looking at the woman who was to be his wife. Now at the palace, Elizabeth heads in to see the emperor who had just finished reading her report on the analysis of Rebellia's high society. He was impressed with her work. She does look like someone who would get the job done to the letter. He was impressed but concerned because Rebellia's social scene was no longer as lively as it used to be. She pointed out that this was probably because of the movement to reject high society as a whole. Women now preferred going to athletic events than dulling themselves up for parties. 
the emperor figured it might have been because of Liliel with her ideals and influence on the younger nobles. As the good sister she is, she diverts his attention instead, pointing out that this change was most likely a result of the new ideals of their neighboring country, Delphinium. He wouldn't have been much of an emperor if he couldn't spot she was just trying to cover for her sister, and so he called her out on it, leading to a swift apology. The stressed man couldn't understand why they couldn't see that participating in high society was the only way to make trade flourish in the kingdom. He had also heard she would be going in place of her sister to the kingdom of Amalilith, something she claimed to have done out of concern for her sister's health in the cold north. He knew she was lying through her noble teeth, but decided it wasn't a total loss. Elizabeth had been handling most of the Crocus family affairs. She was talented and probably a better option for an arranged marriage that served as the foundation for an alliance. He reminded her that her marriage had energy crystals at stake, so she had to always be careful. He actually take pride in contributing to the wealth of her country before sending her off. Is that the best you can say, sir? She had wished or hoped he would at least send her off with a goodbye, but she was having no such luck. Her slight dissatisfaction was washed away upon meeting someone who openly appreciated the hard work she put into the economy of Rebellia. On her way from the palace, she got down from her carriage to take a walk through the streets of Rebellia for what would probably be the last time in a very, very long time. The sight was nothing short of beautiful. While admiring the happiness, a child walks up to her, calling her the villainous of Rebellia. His mother must have taught it to him because she comes running begging for forgiveness on her child's behalf. She expected Elizabeth to blow up at her for teaching her son such, but was instead went with a handkerchief to wipe the blood from the boy's knees as she walked off. She was used to this. She wondered when it all began. It was probably when she slapped Leo back at the academy. She believed presented with the same situation, she wouldn't have done anything differently. No, I'm really interested in the backstory. I guess that's for later. Back at home, she looked through the letter the Duke Wintonite had sent. He hadn't mentioned the change in his bride, which probably meant he didn't care who he married. Just like her. He was called the Monster of the North, but his word showed consideration for his bride-to-be. She walked to the window, taking in the night of Rebellia, wondering what her future husband was really like. Before her departure, she sat her mother down. As the only remaining woman in the house with a tiny, tiny sense of responsibility, to hand over her duties. As she listed the responsibilities she had been shouldering without complaints that her mother would now have to tend to, her mother sighed in exasperation. The work was too much, and she wasn't sure how they were going to handle it going forward. She might have foreseen the reaction or she might just be there efficient, but she informed her mother she had prepared documents for the next month, so she had a little leeway to get used to doing things on her own. A maid comes in to inform Elizabeth that Liliel is on the verge of confronting Duchess April, who she figured was responsible for the cancellation of the charity event Lilia had been partaking in. Upon hearing that, Elizabeth proceeded to make her way to the training grounds where Lilia was taking out her anger on straw men. She calmly suggested her sister stop swinging with so much force so she didn't hurt herself. Lilia couldn't help but swing one more time for good measure. Disrespect. She was angry at her sister too. She was angry that they, aristocrats, considered holding a party and having a good time as a greater priority than a charity event. Elizabeth pointing out that it was not a party, but an exhibition, only angered her even more. It's just a venue for aristocrats to show off their wealth and drink some good wine. Do you have a problem with that? Elizabeth, trying to calm her down, only led her to getting even more infuriated. The duty of aristocrats was not more important than giving back to the community. You're not wrong there. Liliel turned away from her sister in anger and her also faithful knights blocked Elizabeth from following her. The dogs were barking at their master, refusing to step aside even after she warned them of their rudeness. She used her destruction magic, causing just a very tiny earthquake that had the dogs falling on their asses. They were finally where they belong. Liliel did not come when her sister was being disrespected by mere hands, but she did come to chastise her sister for resorting to violence. Elizabeth tried to plead her case, but Liliel was never going to give her a listen ear. She stormed off, leaving a rather bad taste in Elizabeth's mouth and mine. For different reasons, obviously. Duty comes before personal squabbles, so Elizabeth headed for the exhibition. As she walked in, the noble women in their usual fashion began to gossip, saying less than savory things, I bet. Unbothered, she headed straight for Duchess April, the woman Elia wanted to come and fight. The Duchess is a good-hearted person who knows enough of Elizabeth's actions to be sorry for her impending separation from rebellion. Yeah, the only one that has sense here. Kind enough to shut down the ladies at the table who attempted to belittle Elizabeth by calling her a poor soul, 
be married off to the monster of the north. The queen of high society was unbothered by their unfiltered thoughts and instead thanked them for their concern, even though it was just based on the founded rumors. Her counter-attack was to now give them the gifts she had brought for them. Fickle as they are, they shut up and thanked her for the gifts. Say what they would, but none could deny that Elizabeth had great taste. Always in work mode, the gift she gave the Duchess was one newly styled by the Crocus family, advertising for the win. The Duchess worried there would be nobody else to handle this noble with less than noble characters when Elizabeth left. She thanked her for pushing back the charity event so the exhibition could be had. Elizabeth thought she deserved more thanks though because the Duchess's donation would help with providing for low-income families. So under her the solid plan, take a seat, thanks. The Duchess thanked her for all her work during the years. At least some people knew to be grateful. Elizabeth stepped out to the terrace admiring the sunset. This event marked the end of her social life in rebellion. At least Liliel would be happy. They didn't have to fight anymore. The day of her departure had finally arrived. Putting her parents' worries to rest, Elizabeth assured them that she would be fine and they did not need to make the journey to Amalilith for the wedding. Maybe she just didn't want the bad energy. <laughs> her mother's insistence caused Liliel to burst out in annoyance. She argued that the Duke would be angry if he figured out Elizabeth was switched with Liliel. Do you actually think that he does not know? Or do you really believe he don't know who he's marrying? So them attending the wedding wasn't even advisable in the first place. For the safety of their family, girl just shut up. Seeing Elizabeth reiterate that she would be fine on her own, small embarrassments caught her and she could not look her sister in the eyes. She turned away in what I hope is shame. Elizabeth bid her family farewell. Entering the carriage, the Duke of Winternight had sent all the way to get her. She only stopped for a moment to wish her little sister a happy life. Sincerely, you're better than me. Lilia stood in the rear, head bowed as her sister's words sank in, I hope. As Elizabeth proceeded on her journey, she could hear the whispers of the people from the carriage. They were happily to finally be rid of the villainous of rebellia. Her old gentlemanly escort was kind enough to close the window using the cold as an excuse to spare her the words floating outside. Off they went to her future home, Amalilith. As they rode on, Elizabeth entertained herself with books of the north she had received from the ladies of high society. The butler thought it thoughtful she would take time to do that. Basic research is necessary, sir. She asked the butler what the Duke of the North was like. She cared not for the rumours but was interested in knowing anything she had to keep an eye out for. Hearing who was hardly a difficult liege set her at ease. The butler thought it was strange. For someone who had earned the nickname Villainous Rebellion, she was awfully on villainy. That's what I've been saying. They were notified they had arrived at Wapgate, which Elizabeth thought interesting. She had heard only the royal family could use it, and whoever else had to pay quite a lot in fees. To which the butler simply said the Duke had wanted her to have the most comfortable journey possible. Elizabeth let her mind wander to the Duke as they passed through the warp gate. He had sent skilled knights, horsemen, a butler that knows the trade to a tea. He had used the warp gate for her. For a monster, he was awfully kind. Not long after, the cold, snow-ridden mountains of Amalilith greeted them. They rode and arrived at the Archduchy of Winter Nights. As she opened her carriage door to get off, she was greeted, taking her hand in his, by the man who was to be her husband. Welcome, Elizabeth Crocus. They offered polite greetings. She thanked him for coming to get her, but he simply replied it was the right thing to do. Okay, not much else to it. Interesting. He appeared decent, and she couldn't understand what the reason for such a person being called a monster could be. As he ushered her inside, she admired the place she was now to call home. He handed her over to the butler, but not before promising to have dinner with her later. The butler ushered her to her room, where she was finally able to have some alone time. You're tired, Abby? I understand. She settled in for a bath with three maids attending to her while she thought of Lucar and Winter Night. She wasn't sure how he got his terrible nickname, but the man she had seen was kind and polite. A gentleman to the core, albeit distant. Maybe he was like her when it came to marriage. She was dragged away from her strained thoughts by her maids asking for her preferred fragrance. Her asking them for recommendations and actually knowing about the winter day fragrance they recommended was enough to start building high fan base. I'm all for it. As they oiled their hair, they commented on how beautiful her red hair looked, which caught her by surprise. After all, red hair was considered distasteful in Amalith. Her new fan base was determined to make her feel as welcome as humanly and godly possible. 
They assured her their view of red hair was skewed because they didn't have enough of it. Who would dislike a hair that shone as beautifully as a ruby? It might have been her first time seeing so many people actively try to gas her up. It was new and slightly weird, but ultimately it was sweet. At dinner, Lucarin made polite small talk of the taste of their mouth-watering stick. When she called out his full name, he urged her to call him Ren. Ren. Just rules of your tongue. And she urged him to call her Eliza. The name triggered the memory of a legend of Amalilith. The legend of the fairy Eliza, who unsurprisingly has red hair too, and lived deep in the forests of the north. Like me, she loves to sleep. But when she's in a good mood, she flies all over the land, leaving in her trail glittery powder from her wings, what is known as snow to the human folk. Elizabeth considered it a fanciful story. Ren surmised that the snow that was falling outside was the fairy's way of welcoming Eliza to the Archduchy. The idea was quite the romantic one, but pointed out seemed to have touched on the topic they needed to get out of the way. Ren tried to pry into her thoughts on her marriage to him. Eliza was satisfied she had no complaints. His being called Monster of the North had about the same effect her being called the Villainous of Rebellia had on him, which was none. They were both the kind to only believe what they had seen with their own eyes, trauma react. Their similar views on life was appealing, but there was one more thing they could both agree on. While they were individually decent human beings, neither had love to offer their partner. All they could promise each other was to carry out their responsibilities dutifully. The next day, as Elizabeth sipped her tea basking in the sun ever so peacefully, she thought back to her dinner with Ren. She didn't believe in love and had decided to just do her duties as Duchess Winternight. But it was odd luck that the Duke was of the same mindset. He was interrupted midway by the butler. Her shadow was free for the day, but Elizabeth the workaholic was not used to having so much time on her hands. He suggested a tour of the mansion as arranged for the Duchess. So much thought had gone into preparing these rooms for her and she was thankful enough to want to personally tell that to the servants. She had one more plea she wanted to see. No amount of dissuading from Luan the butler could stop her. She was suggesting going out into the duchy without a single hand escort. She promised to protect him if anything went wrong and continued to make her way forward into the market. Workaholic. The place was bustling. The stall owners advertised their goods, the kids skipped around happily and the ladies laughed as they exchanged stories while shopping. She could see from the smiles on their faces just how much Ren loved this land and its people. As she examined the fruits on sale, observing that they cost less than they would have in Rebellia, she heard the cries of a business owner in the marketplace. He had been charged double the market price for spices he urgently needed to fill an order to a client. He was at a loss, but no matter how much he pleaded and begged, they weren't budging in their price. Elizabeth at the back noted the spices were made in Rebellia. Luan explained that the heavy snow made transportation of these goods from the south rather difficult at the moment, so nobody could argue with the prices. They were supposedly lucky to even be seen any. The man continued to beg for mercy. He would lose his profits for months if he were to buy the spices at that price. He was one step short of being driven out when Elizabeth walks up to him asking how much spice he needed. The amount was enough for the winter night's house to cover on their own. She offered to sell the spices to him at less than market price, the condition he picks them up himself. The hand of God had been extended onto him and he would have been a foolish man not to grab onto it for dear life. She had just spoiled the ambitious merchant's market and he wasn't about to let her go scot free. She, not intimidated and appalled by his earlier behavior, assured him she would put in a word with Lord Jackson, the man she knew was his supplier after taking a look at his spices, to ensure the distribution merchants for the region would be changed. Their response, as expected, was threats of violence. She was not afraid to battle, even though she'd rather have refrained from causing a scene. Before she could act in her defense, though, the burly men were grabbed and thrown aside by a very, very charming blonde woman. The merchants, having blind faith in his hired goons, refused to let down. The guy who had his ass handed to him took in the lady's appearance, and what he saw was enough to decide this deal wasn't worth risking their lives over. She seemed to be famous in these parts. They departed for the sake of their personal safety and urged the merchant to do the same. Now unwillingly stripped of his guns, he could only run tail between legs as he backed that they await his return. The beautiful blonde was Dame Bluebell. Luan extended his thanks for her timely support while Elizabeth stood watching their interaction from behind. If Luan was calling her Dame, she was likely a knight. Bluebell asked if Eliza was the lady she had heard much about, but when Luan confirmed and proceeded to begin introduction, she waved him off. She would wait to be introduced at the wedding ceremony. She approached Elizabeth, admonishing her for her carelessness and advising her to use more caution. 
When Luan confronted her about her impolite remarks, she simply walked off. During the carriage ride, Luan filled Elizabeth in on the beautiful blonde. She was a member of the White Knights of the Archduchy and was very skilled, but unfortunately ill-tempered. Although she was a knight of the Winter Knight family, she was the only one who had not sworn allegiance to the Duke. She had simply joined as a means to embark on the Winter Expedition to continuously protect the people. Elizabeth found the young lady interesting and wanted to know more about her. Luan apologized on Bluebell's behalf, but Elizabeth did not fault her actions at all. Moving on, Luan informed her she was to take a look at her wedding dresses the following day. The day the wedding had been set, the best designers of the kingdom had set to produce different designs for her choosing, as is the northern tradition. It was going to be a long process, but Luan assured her that at the end, she would be the most beautiful bride. Elizabeth couldn't help but smile in anticipation of the following day. The next day, the dresses had been lined up and the designer and assistant scurried to bring their presentation to perfection. The assistant was distressed and worried their hard work would come to nothing. After all, their client was the villainess of Rebellia, who loved to coat her dresses in the most expensive jewels. She was unlikely to have refined taste for designs. She was running her mouth and was called back to order by the designer, who was more focused on her future from here. She didn't care what the Duchess was like. This was to her a chance to showcase her designs. Not long after, in walked the angelic villainess of Rebellia. The designer introduced herself as Duran and her assistant Anna, and in a soft angelic smile. <laughs> Duran proceeded to take her measurements in order to make adjustments when necessary. Looking at the figures, it was glaringly obvious that she would graciously slay any dress she wore. Is a figure like that? Yes. The assistant marveled at her hair as beautiful as Ruby. The people that called red hair tacky must not have seen any quite like hers. She had zoned out, only dashing off to work after being snapped back by Duran. Elizabeth sat looking through the catalogue, noticing that the dresses were all unusually extravagant. As a matter of fact, the whole front row was quite like that too. She called Duran's attention to the excess of dresses that were not a type at all. She wanted slender off the shoulder, expose your neck, tiny jewels and right places, kind of sexily beautiful dresses. Duran, realising her mistake for judging the fashion sense of this now retired Rebellia High Society queen, apologised and rushed off to rearrange her goods. With a lineup now more suited to her preferences, Elizabeth walked admiring Duran's well done work. Elizabeth found the dresses beautiful and was having a hard time deciding on just one when she heard Ren's voice suggesting the cream coloured dress. She had heard it was busy, but Ren had decided to make time to be present at the event. He urged her to try it on. He was sure she was going to look dazzling in it. As Ren sat waiting for Eliza to return, he recalled the incident report he had received from Luan as regards the scuffle at the market. She stopped the wholesaler from making excessive profits and sold spices that had been reserved for banquets at the palace for the people's good. The villainous of rebellion they heard so much about hardly seemed even close in description. While wondering how such an angel had gotten such a reputation, Elizabeth walked out of the changing room looking every bit as dazzling as he expected and more. He could only stare at the goddess that was to be his wife. In a daze, he walked up to her, looking her in the eyes. He told her, There's no bride in the world more perfect than you, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. His words filled her with a warmth she had long forgotten. The two people that said nobody should expect love looked at each other with eyes screaming what their brains had yet to comprehend. Duran and Anna refused to get left out of the praise ride, exclaiming Elizabeth looked ethereal like a snow fairy. She went on to pick her remaining dresses and accessories with both Duran and Ren chipping in on what she would look spectacular in. Ren and Eliza occasionally finding themselves oblivious of everything and anyone else but the one in their front. Even Duran and Anna could agree that when they stood together like that, they stood tall and beautiful like a walk of art. Ren worried she hastily picked out her dresses contrary to the tales he heard about brides taking a week to decide. Some of us need the time to think, sir. What's so indecisive? But Elizabeth was more than satisfied with Duran's work. Most importantly, she wanted to wear the dress he had chosen for her. Aww, he smiled at that one. You like the idea of her wearing a trying to sing? Elizabeth asked if she spent too much during this outing, but Ren reminded her that he was built with money, so she had no reason to worry. But more than that, their wedding was once in a lifetime occasion, so he was more than happy pulling out all the stops for her. And Amma Lilith, the royal members, are not allowed to get a divorce something that would most likely apply to Ren too. She was happy though, that the man she would be spending her life with was Ren. Aren't both of you acting completely opposite from what he agreed days before? The butler called Ren away for his next appointment, 
But not before Ren took her lowering red hair in his hand, brushing his lips slightly against it. She was going to be the most beautiful bride on the day of their wedding, and he couldn't help but tell her again. Elizabeth was confident that it was because she was going to be his bride. Oh! <laughs> Ren looked on as she walked off thinking, as opposed to feeling tired. He had quite enjoyed his afternoon with Elizabeth. At a high society party in Amalilith, the ladies gossiped about the hottest topic. The marriage of the Duke Winternight and the Lady of Rebellia was hot. They couldn't believe someone was willing to marry the monster of the North. Not like his partner to be was any better, with her taste for extravagant jewels and her tasteless hair color. The only reason the monster was able to get a bride was because it was a political marriage for the energy crystals Rebellia had to offer. Nobody would have wanted him otherwise. Just keep on going, huh? In a way, the monster and villainess were well suited to each other. As they trailed on, wagging their tongues endlessly, two sensible individuals seated away from them looked appalled by their behavior. Up until recently, they had been trying to arrange a marriage with the Duke and their daughters. His talent, after all, could not be questioned. They wondered what the Duchess was really like. If she was indeed, as the rumor said, that Malili's high society was in for a high tide. They could only wait and see for themselves what kind of person she was. Adults with proper thinking capabilities. Back in Rebellia, the laments declined the liveliness of activities of late. Duchess April, when asked, pointed out that Elizabeth, who put in the most work, had left. Weren't you people happy before? What happened? The ladies added that there had been talk about the Crocus sisters of late. Lilia didn't seem as well liked as she used to be, and her recent events had not turned out well. The food had not been preserved properly, and as a result, much was lost, leaving not nearly enough for the crowd. Compared to the tens of thousands that was put into the events, the outcome was rather disappointing. Young aristocrats had overheard the ladies talking and did not hide their disdain. The ladies didn't understand why Liliel and the younger aristocrats hated Elizabeth so. To their recollection, she had not done anything deserving of such, leading them to believe there might have been a secret the youngins knew that they didn't. In Amalilith, Elizabeth is preparing for her wedding, getting her greeting down in perfect posture and learning the etiquettes and traditions of Amalilith, a quick learner she was. After Luan informs her she was down for the day, she opts out of dinner in anticipation of her dress the next day, her wedding day, and heads inside for a bath after thanking Luan for his continued assistance. It was dark now. As she gazed out the window of her room, she recalled all the events that had led her to this point. Although it had only been a month since then, it felt like forever ago. She wondered if she would be able to live a different life here in Amalilith than she did in Rebellia. <sighs> you will, girl. Hang in there just a little bit. She was interrupted by a late night knock at the door. Wondering who would call upon her so late, she goes to open the door only to be met with Ren. They went for a walk in the garden that looked beautiful in the moonlight. Elizabeth confessed to being a little nervous about the wedding. Ren told her that when he had been told someone else was going to be his fiance, he hadn't really cared. But circumstances had changed after spending time with her. He was glad it was her he was spending the rest of his life with. He promised that while he might not be able to give her love, you're still saying that, he would ensure she lived the best possible life she could in winter nights. He would be the best husband he could possibly be. Elizabeth promised to do the same thinking that if he was with this man, she just might be able to live a different life here than she did in Rebellia. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Did you enjoy it? If you did, please don't forget to subscribe and like, and I shall see you next time.